Thank you. Please have a seat. Uh, gosh, I, I, I'm wanting to make sure. I, I better say my prayer first so I don't mess up. Uh, uh, first of all, let me tell each of you uh, how much I appreciate what you do. Um, you know, I never got into politics until I was just so disgusted as a practicing physician with my elected representative. You know, I, didn't have, I don't have any desire for politics today. But that's ideally what gives us power. And, and what each of you all do every year, the sacrifices that you make, the things you give up, the abuse you take, uh, I want to tell you thank you for that. Uh, that's what makes things work. It's an honor to be before you because you represent the greatest part of America. The part of America that says we can do, we can accomplish. And when you think about ALEC and your membership in ALEC, all the positive things that have come out of this organization that have become law in so many states, uh, it's unbelievable. It's great. And as Mark said, ALEC gets criticized all the time. But it doesn't get criticized because it's a failure. It gets criticized because it's a huge success. So I want to thank you for that. Um, the other thing I want to thank you for is being a leader in your own position, at your own state, or in your own organization. And leadership's about standing on principle but building consensus at the same time. And it means you take heat. You take abuse. You take discomfort. Because you know the goal for which you are achieving or are striving to achieve is worth sacrificing for. And that's really what our founders did. They put it on the line. They said, we want to achieve. And we're willing to risk lives, fortune, and honor to achieve that. So you're in that group. The other point I want to make with you is what history says about republics. History says all republics die. That's a pretty blunt statement. Matter of fact, John Adams said they murder themselves. Uh, and I would put forward to you that we are in the midst of murdering ourselves right now in this country. And you all are the ones that are going to stop that. You see, I actually believe we can cheat history. I think history is wrong. I don't think all republics die. And ours doesn't have to either. And we're going to be the ones that make that difference. <clears throat> Let me just give you a few little facts because one of my disgust with Washington, one of the reasons I left there early, everybody thought I left early because of my health. It wasn't that. I had announced to the minority leader that I, two years before I left that I was leaving. And it's because of the lack of character and honesty that comes out of that organization. Let me just give you some examples. 2013, the CBO and the Government Accounting Office said our deficit was $480 billion. What they didn't tell the American people was is that they added $5.6 trillion that same year in unfunded liabilities. This last year, they said it was $430 billion. But they didn't tell everybody that they added $5.7 trillion in unfunded liabilities. So we're now at the point where we have $143 trillion of bills coming due that we have no idea how we're going to pay for. We have no revenue stream to pay for. And yet, if you ask the people in Washington, everything's fine financially. Matter of fact, Congress just voted to spend money, more money, rather than eliminate waste, defraud, and duplication. So let me do a little poll well, from what you hear from your constituents back home. You think your constituents back home, if you agree with this statement, raise your hand, are worried about the future of our country. Yeah. Let me tell you, I'm 68 years old. It's never been that way in this country. It's never been. I mean, during World War II, were we worried? Yes. But we knew we could solve that. We knew we could win. Today, we have a culture coming up in the millennial generation that doesn't necessarily believe we can win. 
doesn't necessarily believe we can go forward, but we can. And I want to just do a little analysis. I, 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 as most of you know, I'm a, a retired physician now. I still practice occasionally, but I think we look at the problems of our country much as a, doc, a good doctor, a physician, looks at disease. And that is, is you look for the real disease rather than the symptoms of the disease. And what you see Washington doing all the time is treating symptoms, not the real disease. And our founders gave us this wonderful tool with which to treat the real disease. And it's called Article 5. And I'd love to think that we could elect 67 Jim DeMints to the U.S. Senate other great conservative leaders that we could we could have an absolute veto proof majority but that's never going to happen in our diverse country so as you compare what's happening to us i'll just share with you a little bit about my last 15 months i was diagnosed with recurrent prostate cancer stage four with metastatic disease all over my body and i went to the best physicians i could find and I said, I don't want you treating my bone pain. I don't want you treating my symptoms of not feeling well. I want you killing this cancer. And I don't care what it takes. I want you to kill this cancer. And so I went through some very rough, rough times as they attacked the real disease. And I stand before you today with no evidence of disease through the art of medicine as well as the science of medicine but because we aggressively treated the problem, not the symptoms. So, so, I, so, I, so I, I want you to think about that as an analogy of what we need to do to fix our country. I, I walked through the exhibit hall this morning and saw all the things out there. We get it. There's lots of things that need to be fixed in Washington. We do need to have a balanced budget amendment. We do need to have generally accepted counting principle. We do need term limits. We do need limitation on regulations. But what we need most of all is all of us to recognize that we need to treat the real core problem. And that's doing it all at the same time. Addressing the real issues, coming together, and holding Washington accountable. Look, I, I, I spent 16 years up there. I have to tell you, as a physician, I had great insight. I watch body language in politicians all the time. You know, I can tell you when they're, when they're, you know, they're yanking the tail of the donkey. I know. And the fact is, is Washington's never going to fix itself. And we're never going to fix ourselves by just doing one of the things that good, meaning people, well-intentioned people want to do because you're not gonna kill the cancer that way. You have to take it out all the way. You have to use radiation, you have to use chemotherapy, you have to use surgery. We have to do all the things that are necessary to restore our liberties because that's really what has happened to us. I mean, if you think there isn't a state in this country that doesn't have 60% of their education funds controlled by a bureaucrat in Washington, your money telling you how you will spend it. We just got a brand new highway bill, all with borrowed money, by the way, the vast majority of it. But when you go to spend, decide where you're going to spend that money in your state, the federal government's going to tell you how you're going to do it and what you're going to do with it, unless you use all your own state money. That was never what our founders intended. What we need to do is be about cheating history. It's not hyperbole to say is, do we want to solve the problem? I believe we do. What we require is great leadership now. The American people will be behind you. You know, the Convention of States now has over a million volunteers, a million active citizens who are going to be talking to you, saying, help us do this. And in the next year, we're going to have two million. We will eventually have every legislative district in the country with a captain and precinct chairman throughout the country. This is going to be the biggest army of Americans who love our country and love liberty that has ever arisen in the history of our country. 
And the accountability is going to be there. And the support is going to be there to actually fix what ails our country. There's a lot of people who have fear of using what our founders offered to us as a way to fix what they knew eventually would be wrong. And I would just answer to you that our country was built on courage, not on fear. Courage to do the right thing at the right time for the right reasons. This is that time. These are the right reasons. Restoring liberty, restoring accountability, making decisions at the local level and the state level of government rather than having unelected bureaucrats telling us what we will and won't do. And I just lost my notes, so I'll finish without them. Um, at your table, there is a sponsorship inquiry. If you're so inclined, we would love to have you fill that out and talk with us or talk with me about why and how and when we accomplish this. We will accomplish this. There is no cure for our country's ails other than us as citizens and members of states taking a hold and encouraging and acting to solve the real disease that plagues our country. And that's an overgrown, overbloated, outside enumerated power of federal government that's limiting our liberty, limiting our freedom, and limiting our future. So I'll leave you with one last little story, and then I'll finish. There's a little girl who was put to bed by her father. One, a couple of you may have heard this story from me before. Her father put her to bed, tucked her in, told her good night, went back into his room. And about five minutes later, the little girl says, Daddy, I need a drink of water. And she said, Dad, I need a drink of water. He said, "Hun, I just gave you a drink of water when I put you down. Now go on and go to sleep. Ten minutes goes by, and here's this little girl. Daddy, I need a drink of water. Honey, look, you've had a drink of water. You can't have another drink of water. You need to go to sleep. If you don't go to sleep, I'm going to have to come in and discipline you. So about 10 or 15 minutes pass, and she says, Daddy, when you come in to spank me, would you bring me a glass of water? <laughs> Well, there's two points to that story. One is she knew exactly what was required to satisfy her need. Think about we know exactly what is required to satisfy our need to restore liberty and restore balance in this country. The second is she was willing to pay the price through her persistence to accomplish what she needed. That means we have to sacrifice. That means I'm on the road 200 days a year. I'm an old man. I'd like to be playing golf those 200 days a year. But our country's worth it. Our kids are worth it. Our children are worth it. And our grandchildren are worth it. Come help us restore what is rightfully ours in this country today. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you, Senator. We do have some time for uh, questions if you have some. They're all still asleep. Oh, there we go. Way back here. Yes, sir. Well, I, I can tell you, how many of you come from states that have balanced budget amendments now in your state books? How many of you cheat? Now, come on. So the point is, is a balanced budget is needed, but it won't solve the problem. How does that fix the problems with regulators? How does it fix the overreach and the abandonment of the enumerated powers, not only by Congress and the Supreme Court, but by the executive branch? So I'm all for a balanced budget. You know, it was a Republican icon that killed the last balanced budget amendment. Most people don't know it. It was Bob Dole. He was the 67th vote that could have been for it, but he voted against it. All right? So, so I'm, I'm all for a balanced budget, but, you know, that's like taking the cancer and just giving radiation th treatment. You got to do, you got to cut the cancer out. 
You gotta go all the way in terms of treating this disease, which is concentration of power in Washington, at which ends up limiting our freedom and our liberty. Also, our, it limits our economic success, and we don't, don't talk about that often. Why do you think we're not growing more? We're not growing more because the federal government is so massive and so overpowering that it's limiting our ability to grow. Capital's being misdirected. Therefore, jobs aren't being corrected. You know, I, I, just, just as a side, the Department of Economic Analysis just came out with the following. The average federal employee fully covered with benefits and salary makes $132,000 a year. That's 72% more than the average American makes fully vested. Now think about that. Oh, and it's 52% more than the average state employee. So the average state and the average federal employee makes significantly more than the average person that they're supposedly serving. What's wrong with that picture? What politician are you gonna hear talk about that? They're not gonna talk about it. They're afraid they might not get the federal employee votes. So we have to talk about it. The states have to bring it in, say you will do this. Anybody else? Thanks, Senator. What do we have to do to help our federal legislators grow a backbone? Well, I, I would tell you it's genetic. Uh, and if they don't have a backbone when they went there, that you're not gonna grow one. I called it spinal transplant. Um, look, you, you all are in politics. We all have pressures on us every day. But if you really think about what do you really want to be known for in your office, what you want to be known for is really pursuing freedom, really pursuing the greatest possibility of each individual life and expressing their own freedom and limiting the size and scope of the interference that comes from government organizations in that freedom. That's what I want to be known for. And actually, if you're really a good representative or senator, they should never remember you. Because that means you actually did what you were sent up there to do and then you came home. So, so you're not gonna grow, you're not gonna create courage in people who don't have courage. And they have this dreaded disease of having to have strokes, needing the strokes. And so when the big tough question comes up, they, which one helps my election? the most. And I would submit to you that a lot of people in the state house have that. You know, sometimes, you know, and the question is, here's the question, real leadership is what is the real truth? And part of my obligation as a leader is to educate my constituents on even when they're misinformed about why I'm going to go the opposite of what you've been told because here's the real facts. And then spend the time as a leader educating your constituents. What people want is to be able to trust who represents them. And they'll, they'll, they'll support you even when they disagree with you, if in fact they trust you. So it's about building trust. Yes, sir. Uh, two things, one for the record, I actually support any Article 5 effort that will seek to limit the control and the power of the federal government uh, all for the sake of federalism. But my question is, from your perspective, having spent many years in, within the, you know, the monster there within the beltway, what will be the reaction of Congress and the federal government when 34 states do finally put their foot down and demand a convention to propose amendments? As soon as that 34, actually before then, when you get to 31 or 32 states, the first thing that's gonna happen by the career politicians in Washington, the ones that don't have any backbone, is they're gonna hustle up and start doing what they should have been doing all along. They're gonna actually re-embrace their oath. They're actually gonna start thinking long-term about the benefits of what we need to do for our country. You know, think about it for a minute. Every child or grandchild you have is on the hook for a million dollars right now before they start a career. Tell me how we got there. We got there because we lacked the same courage that our founders had in terms of saying no. I was known as Dr. No. I wear it as a badge of honor. 
It's no if it's outside of the enumerated count. It's no if it's not paid for. It's no if it's not a priority for getting this country back on the right side of where it needs to be. So, you know, I'm not for any of them. I'm for all of them. And you don't fix it unless we do them all. And there's only one that's out there that limits the scope and jurisdiction of the federal government. And that's the Article V Convention of States. And the reason that's important is when we, they start seeing us coming, they're gonna get real busy about doing what they're supposed to be doing. You'll see amendments hit the floor. They'll start doing because they wanna still be in control, which tells you central governments never give up power voluntarily, and we have to take it back. And what they'll do is they'll do almost as good, but not near as good as what we'll do. Because we'll actually fix it. They'll put a nice little painting on it and put lipstick on it, it'll still be a pig. They'll still do that. But they'll make it look like they're actually fixing the problem, where in fact they'll just be addressing the symptoms. One more question. Doc, Dr. Coburn. Uh, appreciate your work in D.C. Timothy Barr, Georgia. Uh, we passed several of these in our state. Um, explain to, to us your opinion on the responsibility that this is to state legislatures. I didn't really get excited about this until I understood that the founders actually gave us this power, gave the legislatures the power to um, control and rein in. And, and feel like it is a responsibility um, as a legislator. Can you, can you expound on that a sure, little bit? Sure, I can. Uh, look, when this country was founded <clears throat> and the Constitution was put together, who created the federal government? The states. When's the last time you heard that novel idea? We haven't heard it for 100 years in this country. And, and so if you think about just your oath you take in your state to represent your constituents, it includes upholding this Constitution. And we have the power. You have the power. Georgia is one of my favorites. They've already done all this stuff. We have the power and the responsibility to rein it in. Our problem is, is we, we waited till it almost has gotten too bad to start working on it. Thanks to the leadership of Michael Ferris and Mark Meckler and Rob Nadelson and some of the others, we've started to do this. So, so you can sit back and not be involved in this process, but when you finish at the end of the day and you finish your term in your home and the country is a trillion dollars worth off or six trillion dollars worse off every year and you didn't do something about it, it's you that didn't do something about it. It's not Washington. They're never going to do something about it. But our founders intended for you to have the absolute power to can hold them accountable. And it's time. I want to tell you, they need to be held accountable. I've been there. I've seen it. It stinks. It's about them. It's not about us. And it's time to change that. And you are the ones that can change that. <laughs>